Okay, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, ah, you give us so much in your word, and you gave so much to Paul, and now you are just giving so much to us. Lord, help us to come out with maybe just one thing, thought, idea that will transform our lives today. Um, Lord, help me to be, to have words to say that are comprehensible and, uh, and that you, you will just speak through me uh, and help all of us know how much you love us, how much you care for us, uh, that you died for us as we walk into this uh, season of Easter and are reminded of the sacrifice that you may purposefully, mindfully, intentionally for us. Help us to realize that and take it in personally and live it out broadly to others in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I don't know if you all know, but my mother is 97 years old and she is just hanging on. Uh, and every day, you know, you just almost pray that, you know, she entered the Lord's presence at 97. Well, Pat Hoban is a counselor. Well, he works at our church. I'm not sure what his capacity is, honestly, but he is a counselor by uh, profession, I guess you call it. His dad died March 31st, whatever day that was, Monday or Sunday, at 101, <laughs> at 101, but he was pretty, well, lucid, I mean, he, he lived out, he lived a full life, but Pat this morning, or maybe it was yesterday, sent this little um, excerpt about his dad as he was remembering stories about his dad, and I just thought it kind of fits into what we're studying today, so let me I'm going to have to read it because I didn't have time, just looked at it this morning. Uh, but he says, in the spring of 1939, when my father was 18 years old, he worked at a soda fountain in Stephenville, Texas. One day, a customer came, became quite belligerent and said some ugly things to, to and about my dad. Before my dad ever had a chance to respond or deal with the situation, the man who worked in the kitchen came flying by him, jumped over the counter and grabbed the belligerent customer by the neck and threw him against the wall. The man from the kitchen shouted, don't ever come in here and talk like that to this boy again, get out. So remember this was 1939, the customer who was so rude and unkind to Pat's dad was a white man. And the man who flew out of the kitchen was a black man. It is almost unthinkable that a man of color would do that to a white man in that time. He could have been signing his death warrant. But my dad, at his young age, had befriended the chef in the kitchen. And at that moment, the chef's life didn't matter, matter to him as much as my dad's honor and respect. Today, we're going to look at relationships and how our relationship with Jesus can change how we respond to God and to others and even to our own fleshly desires. Um, so get out your at-a-glance chart of Galatians and your uh, observation worksheet, all your little um, helps that we have that are so awesome. And let's just get back in context. Um, who wrote Galatians? Okay, that wasn't a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try again. Okay, so Paul. And who was Paul? What have we learned in the book of Galatians about Paul? Okay, Lisa, you have won the book, <laughs> but you need to answer more specifically 
Uh, Shannon brought us a new study that they had developed for the Ukrainian. Well, tell us. Well, we do 40 minute studies. These are 40 minute studies. Uh, there are no homework studies, and it's primarily what we use overseas. And we are working with Ukrainian refugees in all of those countries where they have fled to. And what we're doing with them is the study breaking here that's been translated into their language. But I brought one in English. Yeah, <laughs> so fun. So, Lisa, you get it, but you have to continue your answer about Paul. You're on the spot. Okay, okay. Paul is an apostle. How is he an apostle? Did he did he fit the criteria of of apostleship in the eyes of the Jerusalem? Yes, because he saw Jesus. Right, he saw Jesus, but he didn't live in the. I mean, he wasn't one of the people, and he didn't. So, so really, no, he was, but he was not called by who, man or men, but by God. So he was called by God to present a gospel of man. Hey, Lynn, Shannon's here. Were you here when, when we introduced Shannon? <laughs> um, so he was presenting this gospel, not given by man, but given to him by God. Um, so, and the authority of his words were we we found out backed by whom they were given by God? I mean, it was kind of he had this huge experience <clears throat> on the D Damascus Road. It was all God, and yet who backed him up? The church, even the apostles. The apostles backed him up and gave him the authority to be uh, to speak like he did. Uh, and who was he writing to? The churches in the area of Galatia, which is a was was an area, not it wasn't just one church, it was several churches. And why was he writing this letter? Because he was upset. Because why? Why was he upset? Barbara. The Judaizers were trying to convince them that plus circumcision. Right. Right. They had to be a Jew. They weren't denying that you needed Jesus, but they you needed Jesus plus you needed to be a Jew, which that meant you needed to be circumcised, Barbara. Because they wondered what they were Yeah, who knows? And and women were flocking to Christianity because it was such a freedom for women. We don't think of it so much, but they men had all these rights and you know they could divorce, they could sleep with whoever they wanted to, especially in the pagan world. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, this Christianity was coming along and there were kind of more rules and regulations and men couldn't be a polygamist and couldn't do all this stuff that was just ruining their lives. And so not that that's why they were flocking to it, but that just it was the freedom that was giving women to have a voice and have a place. Um, so yeah, what were the <clears throat> the women thinking? Because they didn't have to be circumcised. <clears throat> okay, so what did we learn in Galatians one? Look at your um, your at a glance chart, <clears throat> and what was your um, what what was going on in chapter one? He's a he's defending his Paul is defending his apostleships he's amazed at how quickly the galatians are deserting god <clears throat> and that people are coming in and distorting the gospel <clears throat> giving them an, another gospel but is there another gospel no there is no other gospel um, <clears throat> and so we're, we're finding out that that's why paul is writing this letter <clears throat> um, Okay, what did you, what was your theme for chapter one? Anybody have it written? <laughs> okay. Andrea? The gospel that I received directly from Jesus and you're deserting it already. Perfect, that is beautiful. Yeah. Say it again loud. I preached to you the gospel that I received directly from Jesus and 
you are deserving it already. That is great. That is great. Thank you. All right. Now, chapter two, where did we put, so uh, Ellen did such a great job of teaching chapter two, and, and Paul is relating his experience from where that is similar to what's going on in the Galatian churches. In Antioch, in Antioch. So he's telling them, what does he tell them first about this church in Antioch? Ooh, like hard to think back, isn't it? Um, well, actually, that isn't where it is. In, in Acts, we learned that this church in Antioch had all these different people. Uh, they they name all these people, and you know just from their names that one of them's black, one of them's from Egypt, one of them's from. It, it's multicultural. It is you know just all all different people that have come together and now. Are worshiping together as one and working as a team, which is just unbelievable. So we get this picture that's going on in Antioch, this multi-ethnic church. Um, tell me some more about this church in Antioch. What has it become? The sending church. It's the one that's sending Paul and Barnabas and these missionaries around to, to, to the ends of the earth, as uh, Jesus had told the apostles to do. So it's become pretty much the headquarters for the Christian church. Where, where is the headquarters for the Jewish church? It's Jerusalem, but it has been, uh, as Ellen said, you know, the church has left the building. So it has gone on. Um, so, and they're leaders that gather in this church and do this sending, and the apostles go, go to the church in Antioch all the time to verify what's going on and, and what's happening. Um, and how, so we, we talked about this, but how has Paul been received by the seemingly influential people in Jerusalem? He has given them I mean, they have given him the right, right hand of fellowship and, and the approval that, that Paul is preaching the word that they agree with. So he has that authority. Um, uh, so the contrast in chapter two was what? Do you remember? Justified by faith versus being justified by the law. In verse 16, remember, um, was it verse 16? I think that, that Ellen, you know, um, read to us and kind of said in her own words. And what did it say just over and over? A person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith and not by works. Three times, Paul says, by works of the law, no one will be justified. Three times in one sentence, he is making that clear. So what was your theme for chapter two? Yes. Salvation was all through Christ. Nothing can be added. Great. Salvation is all through Christ. Nothing can be added. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. And what about chapter three? What gifts did Ellen mention that we receive through the gospel? Do you remember? The spirit, along with salvation, sanctification, sonship. And then what else did we, we receive through the gospel? Shall write down Ellen's outline. <laughs> We need a lesson and taking notes. Uh, they received release from the curse of the law and reconciliation as a body, the church. And so what did you put for your thing for chapter three? Carol. Christ fulfills law through the spirit. Christ fulfills law through the spirit. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and, and, and we see here in chapter three, this receiving the spirit, that's, that's, you just see the work of the Holy Spirit in chapter three. 
You received the spirit by faith, but why the law? That was the question, but why the law? So Paul told them the purpose of the law. Um, okay, so last week, Ellen gave us this great mini study of the two covenants. Do you remember what the first covenant was and to whom and what we call it? A lot we refer to Abraham is the covenant with Abraham, and we call it the covenant of grace, the covenant of faith in Jesus' blood, the kind of the new covenant that the covenant of promise is kind of what God gave Abraham. And then she talked about the second covenant, which, which was what? Who was it with? With Moses, and what did it contain? The law. It was kind of the terms of our relationship. So in chapter four, Paul is going to explain our identity with Jesus, which leads to freedom. And this covenant, you know, if y'all studied covenant, we did not too often long ago. Uh, Precepts has a great study in covenant, and it's it's really taking on the identity identity of another person and having their identity be your identity so that and usually are there there are two kinds there's one with equals but there's also one with a king and a, a one lesser anybody's lesser than a king and so it's that king servant servant and i forget what you call it you know what's called um there's a there's a word for it and uh i didn't write it down sorry but anyway yeah Sazerine or suzerine, something. Um, anyway, um, but so so this person that's lesser gets the identity of a king because he's associated with a king and identified with a king, and the king gives him the robe and the ring and the scepter and all that stuff. So so he's got kingly a kingly identity even though he's not a king. Um, so we're going to look at that today. Um, Paul and Ellen last week took great pains to explain why the law. So why the law? Why did God give us the law? To reveal sin, to reveal sin and what else? Guardian. To be a guardian for God's people. That's right. And the people, who were these people? Who were they when, when God pulled them out? They were slaves. They were slaves. So they had slave mentality. So God was giving his people not only a, a guard, but what, what else? So he, he did it to preserve the relationship. Remember, Ellen told us, you know, in a marriage, you have a relationship. And the, the contract of a, a marriage or the vows of a marriage are to preserve that relationship and to keep it strong. And so that is a lot of what, what, what God's law was, but it also guided them how to live. We get into Leviticus and all that, and it's like, do this and, and build a parapet around your house. And, you know, all these little minutia laws that we just are kind of like, oh, what is this all about? But he was just giving them guides on how to live as his people. Um, okay, so let me ask you another question that Ellen actually answered for us last week, so you should know the answer. Um, is this gospel, this new covenant that brings us freedom, freedom from the law, freedom from the law? Is the gospel freedom from the law? Is that the freedom we're going to be looking at? <laughs> Lisa doesn't think so. <laughs> no, no, it's not freedom from the law. What are we free from? That's what, huh? The consequences. Consequences, that's true. Okay. Right. The, the eternal consequence. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so that is actually, you don't really have to answer that because that is what we're going to look at today. What is it we're free from? We get so excited about freedom. And, you know, as a little kid, you just want to be free from your parents and free from this and free from that. But what happens when you get freedom? What happens when you get freedom? You have responsibility. You make dumb choices. <laughs> you make dumb choices and you realize that with freedom comes responsibility, grave responsibility. Um, you can't just in any circumstance, just be free from, from all restraints because that just life doesn't work that way. It's like gravity. If you drop an apple, what happens? It falls to the ground. There are just things like Barbara said, consequences that happen. So you can't truly live free from all things because you will drop to the ground. Okay, so how does chapter four begin? And I got to go find my chapter four so I can see how it begins. What is what are the very first words out of from the pen? Of Paul, <laughs> not that he wrote it in chapters, but what is it? What does it say? I'll tell you. I mean that the air. I mean that. So, as precepts, people, what does that mean to you when you hear "I mean that"? You got to look back because he's obviously said something that now he's going to explain. So we need to go back to what he is actually explaining. He means what, that. Uh, so what has Paul just said? If you are Christ, you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Right, so he's just said, yes, that you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Um, so let's look back. At, at chapter three, um, and I'm going to read verses 22 through 23, uh, 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, we are all sons of God through faith. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So this is what Paul is going to explain. <clears throat> but let's just look. Scripture says, it says, Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. What does that sound like? Talking about slaves and free. What does that sound like? Bondage, right? Bondage. However, the Greek word <clears throat> does not imply that. <clears throat> this imprisoned means to shut up together, include together, uh, to deliver over in the same manner. It is not an imprisonment, it's just a togetherness. So scripture just held them together. It didn't put them in bondage. They weren't back in Egypt where they were in bondage and enslaved by these slave masters. This was just a togetherness. So when you hear that, don't think slavery, that, that the scripture, you know, put them in bondage. That is not it. And then in 23, it says you were held captive. Um, once again, that kind of sounds like slavery in that embondagement. But that <clears throat> Greek word 
I'm not going to try to say, means to be a watchman and or a watcher and uh, and to be in advance to mount guard to protect either to prevent hostile invasion or something else, but it's a, a word of protection. It is not captivity like a slave would be or, or a uh, prisoner of war would be imprisoned. It is a guardianship. Uh, so that goes back to what Ellen was telling us before that this, the law was not to imprison us, but it was to guard us and guide us. Um, okay. So then, okay, on, let me look. So, so in all this, what we've just read, what is Paul saying here? What is he describing to us in chapter three that in scripture they were imprisoned under, uh, um, well, scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith and, and, and then he says, in, for, for in Christ, you are all sons of God. And if you are Christ, you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What is Paul describing to them? He's describing their identity in Christ. He says, when for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's our identity. When you are baptized, you are identifying yourself with Christ. You are declaring that you believe in and identify with everything that Jesus Christ believes in and identifies himself with. That's what you're doing when, when there's a baptism. And that's what we're we're doing with kids when we, in the Presbyterian church, we baptize kids, but we're just saying that we are believing that this child is identified with us and in that, that, that he is identified with Christ. So you are identified with Christ by faith. And we, um, Jews, are identified by faith in Christ. <clears throat> so what happens? Let me see. I think I've skipped. Look on page um, 73 of your homework. <clears throat> and you kind of looked at this. The we and the you as Paul. You've got you to watch Paul because he's um, subtle in how he <clears throat> um, points things out. But he says... <clears throat> So he's explaining, I mean, that the heir, as long as the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born of the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Who are the, these we? We looked at it on page 73. Who are the we that Paul is talking about? Hmm? 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 Right, right. But listen to who he's talking about. What I mean is the heir, who has he, he been talking about? <clears throat> Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So who are these, who originally were the heirs of Abraham's promise? The Jews, the Jews. So Paul is seeing himself as a Jew. He was an heir. He was the original, from the original family, the chosen ones. They would call themselves, excuse me. So these are the Jews. He's really not talking believer, non-believer. <clears throat> He's just saying we were heirs. We were children. We were under guardianship. That's who we were. 
the ones that were having such a hard time with this were the Jews. That's who he's sending to train. Exactly. Exactly. The Jews, yeah. The Jews didn't get it because they were the heirs. They were the promised ones. So they should have received everything. So <clears throat> Paul's just saying, we, we, the Jews, the Jews. And what happens to the Jews when Jesus came, <clears throat> let's just take a moment. We're not going <clears> to <throat> go there right now, but <clears throat> it says, in the same way, we Jews also, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were children, were enslaved to what? What were they enslaved to? The elementary principles of the world. They were not enslaved to the law. They were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. And y'all looked at that in your homework, and we will look at it soon, I promise, <clears throat> if I don't pass it by. But so then in the fullness of time, when that had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, which what did that mean that he was born under the law? He was a Jew. He was born in that chosen family. He was a Jew. <clears throat> so he's born under the law to do what? to redeem those who are under the law. <clears throat> so that what? They might receive adoption. They might, re <clears throat> they might re receive adoption. I'm so sorry about my voice. But I thought they were sons of Abraham. Thought they were sons of God. That's what they thought. But what did they need? Redemption. They were Jews, but they needed redemption. Right. Okay. So he's really not, <clears throat> he's not, he's writing this to the Galatian church, which were primarily Gentiles. So that's really his audience. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. They were being told by the Judaizers. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. His audience is not to the Jewish people. He is explaining this to the Gentile people, which somewhere in here. <clears throat> um, that Paul is getting ready to explain the difference between Jews being justified by faith and Gentiles being justified by faith. Uh, what it means for them, for us, to make our identi identity and chief identity with Christ. But these are, <clears throat> his, his, his thinking is he's telling these people who don't know anything about the Old Testament. They've been a Christian. If we look at the, uh, the timeline, of Paul and, and, and choose to believe that he wrote this right before the Jerusalem Council in 47, 48. They'd only been Christians a year. They don't know the whole Old Testament. We don't know the whole Old Testament. And we are old. And we, you know, have known the word for a long time. So, so he's talking to, um, to young Christians that, that the Jews grew up learning the Old Testament. They went to synagogue and they heard the word and they knew the word. But these people, Barbara, to your point, don't know any of this stuff. I mean, and what they do know, they just have heard from Paul and now these Judaizers who are coming in and saying, well, now you need to be a Jew and, and, and you know, you do our customs because that's what you need to do. So they don't know. They don't know. They're confused. Um, so, okay. Um, so when the fullness of time had come, they needed to be redeemed just like, and they needed to be adopted as sons, because even though they thought they were descendants of Abraham, and they were literally descendants of Abraham, but they needed <clears throat> redemption and adoption. And what showed them that? 
What had shown them that they needed this redemption and this adoption? The law. The law. That was the point of the law. Why? The law. To let you realize that you need God. You need Jesus. They needed him. We need him. Um, so remember what Ellen said last week. I just love it. That, you know, God brought the law. Moses told them what the laws were. And what did they immediately say when he brought the law? We'll do it. Yay. And then the minute, what Ellen said was, you know, the period wasn't on the end of the sentence when what? The blood began to flow because they couldn't keep the law. So then they had to step into the sacrificial uh, system that covered their sins because there was so much sin that they needed that covering that God provided as a picture of what was to come. Uh, so what does, so let's look at verse six. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart saying, crying, Abba, Father. Okay, uh, so on that same page in our homework, now, who is he talking about? The Galatians. He's been talking about the Jews and their position with God. But he says, how can he say that? How can he say? Because you are sons of God. What has he just said in verse 326? Or in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. He's just told them that in Christ, you are sons of God. So he is letting them know that the Jews had to be adopted as sons and they have been adopted as sons because of their faith, because God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, so what? You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, just like the Jews thought they were, heirs through God. Formally, so then he's telling them what they formally were. Formally, when you did not know God, the Jews knew God, but they did not. Formally, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature were not gods. They were enslaved to whatever it was, whatever God was out there that they followed because they didn't know any better. They didn't have the, the vision of God and he, they didn't have that example to grow up under. And yet it didn't matter because of Jesus, but you did not know. So by nature were no gods, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. Paul makes that point that it's God that went after them. They think they went after God, but God went after them. However, that works out. And how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? What were they in bondage to? the elementary things of the world. So we need to figure out what in the heck that is because that's what brings brought bondage to the Jews, brought bondage to the Gentiles and brings bondage to us. Whose slaves you, uh, whose slaves you want to be once more. So, so he's asking them, you know, you knew, you know the bondage you came out of you didn't have God. You didn't have that guardianship. You didn't have that advantage that the Jews think they had. But you knew you were enslaved and you were glad to get out of that slavery. So, so are you going to put yourself back into that slavery? And then he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. And let me see. Let me make sure that I'm not skipping. So, so. Uh, to slaves in years. So on page 75 of your homework number three, three, it, it, we look at these elementary principles 
of the world. And you looked at Colossians 2, 2, and then 20 through 23. What did that say about these elementary principles of the, the world? What, what were they according to, how were they defined in Colossians? Human traditions. Human traditions. Philosophy, empty deception. They have the appearance of wisdom, but not valuable against fleshly indulgence. So there were things that, that, that they adhered to, but if they really didn't help your fleshly indulgences. They were decrees, commands, and teachings of men. These are things that are opposed to living by faith in Christ. And let me just say, there is so much debate in, in the, I don't know, academic world about what this, this really means, these elementary principles of the world. Um, the Greek word, stoikia to kosmu, uh, the elementary principles could be translated. One, one person I was listening to said, um, every translation of the Bible that you get will translate it differently. That's how diverse this word is, that they can't, can't come upon one, uh, one exact definition. But Paul is telling the Galatians that the Jews and the Gentiles were in bondage to the same thing, these elementary things, whether principles or spirits. And in verse 8, Paul says um, the Galatians have been in bondage to beings that by nature are not God. So in, in eight, he tells them, you are enslaved to, uh, to those that by nature are not God. So, so he told them they were embodied to these non-gods, which would indicate what kind of spirits would you? Well, I think, I don't know. For me personally, I believe that there's something that God has made Self. Because in the world, Day. Yes. That's what we have to do. Right. That we don't put our own ideas on what it means to be a Christian. Yes. So we stay in the world. Yes. Exactly, Carol. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. That, that I don't is. Think it matters what the elementary principles were. Yes. How do you get off track? Right. Right. How do you get off track? Right. Okay. So, so, right. In chapter, I mean, in verse eight, it kind of sounds like demons are evil spirits, but how can bondage to the law, because they were, they weren't in bondage to the law, but they were in bondage to these principles of the world. So, um, but if you translate, you know, the elementary principles being uh, evil spirits, then you think, well, if, if Satan was in, in charge of it, then that can't be because God gave us the law and it was given to Moses by angels, it says, and mediated through angels. So what does Paul mean? Um, uh, so what Paul means, let me see where it starts because uh, John Stott has a great description of this. Where did I put this? Um, I don't know where it starts, but I'll just read it to you. Uh, so, so how can a bondage to the law be called bondage to evil spirits? Is Paul suggesting that the law has an evil design of Satan? Of course not. He has told us that the law was given by Moses, uh, to Moses by God, not Satan, and mediated through angels, uh, 319, uh, which we would call good spirits, not bad spirits. What does Paul mean? What Paul means is that the devil took this good thing, the law, listen closely, and twisted it to his own evil purpose in order to enslave men. And that's what Carol's talking about. God intended the law to reveal sin and drive men to Christ. Satan uses the law to reveal sin, to drive men to despair. God meant the law as an interim step to man's justification. Satan uses it as the final step to his condemnation. God meant the law 
as a stepping stone to liberty. Satan use it, uses it as a cul-de-sac, deceiving his dupes into su supposing that from this fearful bondage, there is no escape. That was how John Stott described it. So it's not that the law was bad or an evil elementary evil thing, but it's that Satan twisted it and said, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And the heart of the law was lost. So what Carol was saying is exactly right. And then Tim Keller explains it similarly when he says, you're saying that Satan twisted man Yes. Well, or whatever it is. What I mean, if you I mean, yeah. <clears throat> just taking the law, I mean, it's just man's innate nature to say, well, the law says this. It's like Satan came to Eve in the garden and said, Hath God said, do not eat of the fruit. And then how did Eve respond? She said, oh, God said, don't touch it. So she added to it. She added to it. And that's just our inclination. We just take it a step deeper. And, and whether that's an evil spirit that, or whatever, it's our fallen nature that, that takes it further. Elizabeth. Satan's nature to take that good. And turn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he just takes it and he says, oh, you can't, don't, don't touch, don't eat, you know? And then we're like, oh, don't touch, don't eat. And, and then what Carol says is it's, it's how you respond to it. And then all of a sudden you make it your idol. You make it something that you can't live without. And if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. And it's not the heart of what God, how God made it. So, so Tim Keller explains it this way. He says, what brings bondage is taking something that is good and making it ultimate. Only Jesus can be ultimate. Therefore, anything outside of Jesus turns into idolatry, and idolatry brings bondage. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this about idolatry, connecting kind of Stott's idea as well as Tim Keller's, the greatest enemy that confronts us in the spiritual life is the worshiping of idols. The greatest danger confronting us all is not a matter of deeds or of actions, but of idolatry. What is idolatry? Well, an idol can be defined most simply in this way. An idol is anything in our lives that occupies the place that should be occupied by God alone. Anything that holds a controlling position in my life is an idol. So of course, an idol may indeed be an actual idol, but it does not stop at that. This is, this is Martin Lloyd-Jones, would that God did, but idol idolatry may consist of having false notions about God, like Carol said. If I'm, worship if I'm worshiping my own idea of God and not the true and living God, that is idolatry. But let me go to the point to point out that idolatry can make can take many other forms. This is still Martin Lloyd Jones. It is possible for us to worship our religion instead of worshiping God. How subtle a thing this idolatry is. We are enslaved to the elementary principle of the world, the principle that says we don't need God. We can live life without God or that there is something out there better than God, that we ourselves can be God. Remember, that was Satan's hook for, Adam, for Eve. If you eat of the apple, you can be like God. If you know the difference between good and evil, you can be like God. So that, that <clears throat> if we have the knowledge, this is what, the, of good and evil, we can figure out how to live right. Okay, so there's that. Now let's go back and look at uh, verse 10. And Paul um, calls out the Galatians by telling them what? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Okay, we don't really know 
if the Judaizers are telling them all of a sudden, no, you need to do Passover and you need to do this and you need to do that. Or if they're the Galatians, you know, the, the, the pagans had their days and their, their you know, their ceremonies. I mean, uh, yesterday or one day was the beginning of Ramadan. So, you know, everybody's, not everybody, but a lot of religions have their, their sacred days. So we don't know one way or the other, but, but either way, they're kind of going back to the habits of what they have come comfortable with. And then in verses 11, if we look at 11, Paul says, I am afraid I have labored over you in vain. And then in verse 20, he says, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone for I am perplexed about you. What is this revealing to us about Paul's relationship with the Galatian people? He's frustrated with them. But why is he so frustrated with them? He cares really deeply about them. He cares that they're being tormented by these Judaizers and confused and uh, bewitched. And he's frustrated with these people who are telling them wrong things. Um, so moving on, let's look at verses 12 through 20. <clears throat> um, we see that not only does Paul care about them, but they obviously care much about him. Paul shifts from explaining their identity as an heir and as a son of God. Um, and what does he talk about? Hmm? His ailment. His ailment. But he's talking about their relationship with him and how they took care of him. And... What does he call them? He starts this by saying in verse 12, brothers. So he's, he's friends with these people. Brothers, I entreat you, um, become as I am, for I also became as you are. You did me no wrong. What does this remind you of when he says, I became as... <clears throat> um, Become as I am, because I became as you are. What did we, you all that um, studied Acts? Was it in Acts that we looked at that? I think it's in Colossians, actually. <clears throat> Where he said, I became all people, all things for all people, so that I might save one, you know? So, so that was Paul's heart. He wasn't doing it. He didn't, he didn't waver. He didn't compromise the gospel. Um, but he sees and understands that even as a Jew, he was free from the law, just as a, the, the Galatians were. So he lived free from the law, the, the Jewish laws, because that's how the Galatians lived. And he came to them on their, their level so that they could understand. And he came telling him, you know, his story of the Damascus Road and how he persecuted the Christians. And he was one of those ones that that came against them so that they knew he was where he was coming from. He was as sinful as they were. He needed redemption. He needed to be adopted as a child of God, even as a Jew. He was, even as a Pharisee and a keeper of the law, he discovered he was chief among sinners and needed a savior. Um, so how did the people of Galatia treat Paul on this first missionary journey? Um, how, were the, how were the Jewish people responding to Paul on that first missionary journey? You all remember, we just, we just studied Acts. They persecuted him. He had been stoned in one of the cities. Let me just read you kind of excerpts from Acts 13. Uh, Ellen had us read it uh, last week. But so the setting is Antioch, Pisidia, which is in Galatia. And it says, this is 1344, and this is just like excerpts. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, 
it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, the Jews, and then the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews stirred up persecution, like Barbara said, against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. And then in chapter 14, it says, <clears throat> an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews to mistreat Paul and Bar Barnabas and stone them. And then they went to Lystra and Derby and continued to preach the gospel. And in Lystra, Paul was stoned. And this is all the Galatian area. Paul was stoned and left for dead, but he went to Derby. And in 1441, when they had preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconia and Antioch, all Galatia, strengthening, strengthening the hearts of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So this, the, these Galatians, how had they seen, what had they seen about Paul and Barnabas? They were reviled stone. I mean, it, and you look gruesome when you're stoned, let me just tell you that. And, and so, and they were coming alongside him and helping him and he looked awful. And he, I mean, it's kind of like the reaction of that black guy that just would have been unthinkable at the time. It would have been unthinkable for these people to come around side these men, these Barnabas and Paul who were being rejected and reviled and stoned and ridiculed, but they came alongside him and cared for him and took care of him. They loved him because of the heart of the gospel that they had received from Paul. Okay. Now let's read Galatians 4, 13 and 14. You know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. You see how much they loved him and cared about him. And then Paul asks, that rhetorical question, what has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes for me. That's how much they loved him, that they would have done that. And this word blessedness in the Greek really means, in ancient sources, it was used as a metaphor for sacrificial love this blessedness that they had a sacrificial love for Paul and Barnabas so that is what this gospel has opened up their hearts to these gifts that Ellen was telling us last week you that we get the spirit within us that cries Abba Father it also gives us a heart for each other um, that that shouldn't be there Maybe not shouldn't be, should be there, but in our convoluted world is not there. Um, so, um, so they were doing everything they could for Paul. And then what is the next question, rhetorical question that Paul asks them in verse 16? I become your enemy by telling you the truth. When you have good friends who you trust and rely on, believers who care for your spiritual growth and your well-being, how do you receive the truth from them? Even if it's hard truth, even if it's something that you're doing wrong, how do you receive that? You embrace it. You're thankful that you have a friend that is honest enough to tell you you've got spinach in your teeth or whatever. <laughs> or, you know, yeah. Anyway, you are happy to hear that because why? 
you know they loved them. And so Paul is just throwing out this rhetorical question, why? To remind them how much they care about Paul and how much the truth, though it hurts, they accept because, because it's Paul. It's, it's our friend. It's who we would have gouged out our eye for. You know, this is that guy. And then he goes and he starts talking about, in contrast, you know, Paul just is contrast after contrast after contrast. And he's like, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may, be, may make much of them. What does that sound like? They're using them, you know, they're trying, they want to look good. And so they're complimenting these Galatians and they're, they're trying to get them, you know, on their side. And yet it is the Eddie Haskell thing. I'm being nice, but it's for my own purpose. It's for my own gain. So you can think I'm cool and I've got the right words and, and all that. So John Piper says to make much of would not be, would not have been his choice of how to, um, translate this word, zelu, uh, which usually carries the sense of desire or to long for in a fairly strong way, uh, either positively or negatively. So John Piper says the Galatians exalts, Galatians, the book, the, the letter, exalts two things, the cross of Christ as the only way a person can get right with God, and the spirit of Christ as the only way a person can obey God. Anything that diminishes the beauty and all sufficiency of what happened on the cross of Christ is offensive to Paul. Anything that puts our willing or running where the Holy Spirit belongs is witchery to Paul. And the reason we, we sense a kind of compassionate rage running beneath this letter is that someone had bewitched the Galatians and put themselves where the spirit belonged and the works of the law where faith in the cross belonged. Does that happen today? Yeah, yeah. And think about what it looks like. There are people we know that try to put us back in bondage by using the truth as a sword in our lives. And um, I don't know where I have it, but, but Tim Keller made the point that there are people who use the word as a sword and try to, you know, and it's not necessarily wrong. I mean, we're usually wrong, you know, and the truth comes out and you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't do this, but it's how it's used because people use it as a sword. You remember Ellen said the sword cuts both ways, but what Tim Keller says is, as when we have a relationship with each other, we can use, use it as a scalpel to heal. It's, it's still an instrument that cuts and removes sin, but it is a healing instrument. And you use it in a way, in a loving way that can help and heal and restore rather than cut down and kill and destroy. All right, let's move on and look at Verses 19 and 20. Are we getting anywhere? Then you just see Paul talking to the Galatians and my little children. And he's not, that's not a condescending thing, like you are just babies and don't know anything. It's because he cares for them, for whom I again and am anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. He cares so much about them that he wants them to grow up and he doesn't want them. He wants them kind of to be in that protective womb so that they can grow up without these horrible things happening to them. Uh, but that is just, once again, his heart for them. Okay, so in the last paragraph, we move from this relationship with each other, with Paul and the Galatians, and then he starts this whole new, well, it's not a whole new thing, but he's going back to, um, so, he's, so he's giving an illustration. He's giving an illustration. And he says, um, 
my little children, let's see, where are we? 21. Um, what does he ask him? Once more, another rhetorical question. Um, what does he say in 21? And he's talking to the Galatians who are saying, oh, you know, these Judaizers coming in and maybe we should get circumcised. Maybe we should get back under the law, like those Jewish people are saying. Sounds good. Sounds good. And what does he say? Do you not? Go ahead. <laughs> Do you not? Okay. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? Okay, let's think about these old people. How long have they been Christians? A couple of years at the most, one probably, and they have not grown up learning the law. They don't really know what the law is. They probably don't even realize that the Israelites, the Jewish people, you know, who are touting the law, could never keep the law, could never ever keep the law. They don't tell them that part of the, the the deal, the scenario. So, so the, the Gentile, the, the Galatians are like, okay, we'll do the law, we'll do the law. And then they just don't get that if, if you don't do one little iota of the law, you're breaking the law. So they don't get that. Um, so, so then Paul's like, okay, y'all that want to get under the law, do you, do you get the law? Um, but anyway, okay, so they don't realize. Okay, so Paul, like I said, is telling them a story. They've heard about Abraham. Obviously, these Judaizers are saying, we are sons of Abraham. We're heirs of the promise, whatever they're telling them. So they know Abraham. And um, But keep in mind, what Paul's getting ready to tell them could be the first time they've ever heard this part of the story, the Hagar, Sarah thing, you know, because truly, they haven't been Christians that long. And they haven't done the word that long. Um, and so, so let's just listen to Paul as he takes this story and, and makes an illustration for them. He starts by saying, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave woman, slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. When he started out by saying, for it is written, what is he telling them? What is he telling us? It's God's word. It's a true story. This isn't like a made up story. I'm not just making up and a C.S. Lewis story. This is like a true story. This is a true story. But he goes on to say, in verse 24, what does he say about this story? He is using it as an allegory. This can be interpreted as an allegory, which when you mention that to scholars, it sends them into orbit because you can't just take anything in the Bible and make it an allegory out of what you want it to say. It, that is not how it works. But, but, there is truth in the word. And so like Pat's story about his dad, there's truth in that word and it can still apply to different things. So this is what Paul is doing. He's not giving them a biblical lesson, a theological lesson in the covenants or even you know, how God treated these, these two sons or these two wives. It's, this isn't what he's telling. He's just giving them an example He's giving them an example of two covenants and two people and then how they can live accordingly using this story as an illustration. It's not, it's not a lesson on covenants. It's not a lesson on, on anything that we might put into it. Uh, it is just Paul's example. Um, so it's a little like what Ellen told us last week about the offsprings of Abraham, the offspring of Abraham, remember Paul said, who was the offspring of Abraham? Jesus, Jesus was the promised seed, but he also said, Abraham had lots of offspring and the offspring were to be blessings to the nations. So it's not like that, that negates everything else 
that is said about offspring. It doesn't mean every time you hear the word offspring, that means Jesus. That's not the way it goes. Uh, so you just don't get bogged down in the details of Paul's illustration with theological questions about, well, what does that mean? Because he's not using it as a theological lesson in this regard. He's, it's just an illustration. So with that being said, let's look at pages 83 and 84 of your homework, where we look at these two covenants, these two sons, um, and see what it says. Abraham has two sons, which Paul equates with what? The two covenants. And the one covenant, what did he say about it? You, you drew either drew a picture or you wrote, uh, you either wrote it out or you drew a picture or, you know, some of you overachievers probably did both. Um, but what did, what did you see about the, the one, the, the, let's start with Hagar, this covenant, the two son, the one covenant, was by whom? The slave woman. I don't have room to write, but the slave woman. And what did she represent, Hagar? What did Hagar, the slave woman, represent in Paul's analogy, the covenant where, from where? Sinai, it would be the law. Okay, and what city? He also had two cities that he was comparing. And what city did this compare to in Paul's analogy? The president, well, Sinai was in Arabia, and interestingly enough, Hagar was from was an Arabian, and so, so you know that kind of just went together. That Sinai was in Arabia, that's where they got the law, uh, not in, not in, the the promised land, but in Arabia. Uh, so, but what what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Which Jerusalem? How does he? How does he? The present. Jerusalem. The present corresponds with the present Jerusalem. And what is he saying when he says the present Jerusalem? Under law, because the Jewish, what is Jerusalem to the Jewish people? The temple is there, and that's where God is, and that is their holy city. That is the present Jerusalem. It's the physical Jerusalem. Uh, so, it, so, and then so she is in slavery with her children, the present, and he was, somebody mentioned it, the son according to what? The flesh, this is, we're still on Hagar, the flesh, um, and does it say here, bearing children, Hagar corresponds to the present Jerusalem, slavery with her children. Um, okay, then he switches and he's talking about the second covenant and the second uh, heir. So this son, what is the city that is associated with this son? The Jerusalem above, the Jerusalem above. So there's a Jerusalem, there's a city of God that is above wherever that might be. Not, not the physical Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem above. And who is there? Who is that? Who is the mother of that? Sarah. Sarah. And and who is the child? Isaac. And they are the children of what? Promise. Promise. Born according to the Spirit. They're children of promise. So these are the two covenants. You've got the covenant of promise, and you've got the covenant of the law, and the covenant of the flesh, and the covenant of the Spirit. Um, so believers, those who have faith, are sons of who? The free woman. If you have faith, you are sons. You are in in this camp with the sons of the son of promise, and you are not the son of the slave woman. So what? And then he says do, 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 in thirty. But what does scripture say? What did scripture say in verse 30? 
cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Why? Because they're slaves and they, they, they were not promised the promise. Y'all looked at the cross references on page 78 of your homework. And um, so let's just quickly look. Whose idea was this solution, the Hagar solution, I will call it? Whose idea was it? It was Sarah's idea. And did, but, but did, and it was a bad idea. That was like our human effort. You know, God said, I promise you an heir. And then what happens? God promises you something. And then you say, oh, I can figure this out. I'll do it. I'll figure it out. And you, it doesn't happen in our timing or in our way or anything. It's just so encouraging again. The, the patriarchs and all of the world gods are such fools. All the way through. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. never, never like the awesomeness of Abraham or his faith is so great. Yeah. It, it, his faith is a mustard seed. It is a grain of sand. Right. Like that. It's right. just not right. Right. But what was the greatness of his faith? It's in God. In who it was in. Right. It was who it's in us too. Our faith is pleading, but it's who our faith is in that makes it great um good point okay so did god we looked at the story did god disregard totally ishmael no. remember he saw little hagar you know out in the wilderness and and you know and then what did he promise ishmael that he would have children of course he told him he would be a wild donkey of a man <laughs> and everybody would be against him but hey God did not disregard him at all. Uh, so what happens in uh, Genesis 17, 11 through uh, 27? What did you see here? What happens? Hmm? The promise to Isaac, God establishes circumcision. Who gets circumcised? Everybody, Ishmael gets circumcised. Abraham, circumcised. Uh, but what does God tell Sarah, who came up with this great plan that backfired on her? Come from you. And his promise was fulfilled that she would have Isaac. And then what do we learn in, in uh, chapter 21, 8 through 13? This is where we see this mocking of Ishmael. What happened? Isaac comes of age and they have this big feast for him. And then Ishmael, you know, the 14 year old is like, eh. why can Ishmael be that way? He's jealous. And he also knows that Abraham loves him. So he's thinking, you think you've got a big baby, but I'm bigger and older. But, but, and who decides to cast him out? Was it God that cast him out? We hear, you know, uh, Paul says, cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not inherit. But who actually gets the idea of casting out? Ishmael. It's Sarah again. Oh my gosh. She's just like, get it, get it. Anyway, but that was, that was by God's design. So that all worked out. Then they had us look at Jeremiah 31. 31 through 34, and we love this, and this is the new covenant, and how is this different than both the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant? How is it different? Right. He's going to write his heart, his law on our hearts, and okay, I heard one <clears throat> commentator said, you know, the law was thou shalt not, and you shall do this, and you shall not do that. And what does this new covenant look like? What will happen? They will be God's people. He will be their God. They will know him. He will forgive their iniquities. He will remember their sins no more. It's like Ellen said, it's all God doing the work. Do you think it probably won't have it in hell here Pardon me? Do you think it's talking about heaven and hell here also? 
Because I'm thinking about like how Ishmael is persecuting Isaac. It's just like the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Like it was Palm Sunday, the big celebration. They persecuted Jesus. And then, um, but then Jesus ends up passing them into hell. And like, and Ishmael gets passed out. And then, um, and like, they shall all know me, like the whole world, when the whole world is filled with the knowledge of God at the very end, you know? And like everyone else is. That I don't know. Okay. Good, but and like I said, that's where that's where um, scholars would kind of go bring it in. But 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 you know, I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I just didn't see it. Yeah. So awesome, but I didn't see it, and, and that's that doesn't make it wrong. But it says it's going to disappear. So the old covenant. Yeah. And so that tells me that we're not even. Yeah. The word heaven is Jesus. Right. Because we will be all transformed. Yeah. So I think, in a way, you're right. Yeah. That it's heaven and hell, but not specifically. Yeah. I don't know. But going back to Hebrews quickly, <clears throat> the Hebrew passage says <clears throat> the law made nothing perfect, Jesus became the guarantee of a better covenant. And then Hebrews 8 actually quotes Jeremiah 31 and how all this is going to be in our hearts and it should be bleeding into our hearts now, even as we live on earth. But these, this fulfillment of this promise, this huge, huge fulfillment that, that Jesus did uh, when he was here is what gives us what? Gives us hope for the future. That all, so much of the covenant, all, both covenants, the law and Moses, and there, there are more covenants. There's, there's the covenant with Noah, and there's the covenant with David, and there's all that. And so much of that was totally fulfilled. Oh, I shouldn't say totally, was fulfilled in Christ Jesus, but there's more. There's more. So what can we base our hope on, base our faith on? That if Jesus did what he did, the rest is yet to come. And we can believe it and be sure of it because it will come. It will come. Okay, so like I told you all, I wrote it down. I might not have told you, but, but uh, and, and Asaka. No, no. Asaka. Asaka. I don't know Asaka if it was you, but the, the week you did your um, testimony or your talk, which was awesome, another young girl who was a ballerina did a talk in another study that I'm in that I dropped out of because I couldn't do it both. But anyway, <laughs> but one of you, I can't remember which, was talking about ballet and how the basic, the basic position or, or, or thing is the plie, you know, I'm not even sure what a plie is, but anyway, the basic position. And so we're thinking about that elementary um, thing, but it, it's, it's like going back to the basics. Any dancer can do a plie, but even a prima ballerina starts with a plie. Right. I said that. You, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Okay, all right. So even a prima ballerina starts with a plie, the very simplest starting point. Similarly, a pianist starts with a scale. Training a dog starts with sit. Singing a song starts with do re mi. Reading with ABC. Coming to God. Being changed by God starts with faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what is the truth of the gospel? That Jesus Christ, who willingly allowed himself to be crucified on the cross for our sins, died and was buried. The third day he was raised to life by God, our Father. This is quoting Galatians 1. Delivering him from our sins and from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Jesus was the fulfillment of the requirement of the law. Jesus paid the price as a sacrificial lamb of God. Whenever we struggle 
with what to believe or what not to believe, we need to start with a plie, with a scale, with a sit, with a do, re, mi, or an ABC. Start with the truth of the gospel, which reveals the truth about God, the truth about the law, the truth about our identity, and the truth about Jesus, the truth about a sacrificial love that never lets us go, but changes us forever. All right, let's pray. Well, do we pray? I usually close the prayer. Oh, okay, okay. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for filling our hearts. Thank you for your sacrifice that we are going to celebrate next week and help us realize just how much you love us and care for us like Paul and the Galatians cared for each other. Help us just be transformed by your love, by that simple plie of going back to who and what you did for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn off the recording.